Thank you for downloading this podcast from Emmanuel Church Lurgan. At Emmanuel, our vision is to help rewrite the story of Craigavon, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the Kingdom of God. We hope you enjoy listening to this message. It's great to be um, with you this morning. It's great to start our new series called The um, Air That We Breathe. Uh, it's, um, if ever you've carried something in you, that you're not dead sure how it's going to come out. That's how I feel this morning. I'm nervous. Um, and uh, yeah, I said this to somebody yesterday. They said, Phil, you're doing it long enough now to get over the nerves. But I had an old, uh, the old man who led me to the Lord back when I was six years of age, took me preaching my first time when I was 11. And I said to him after a few times, when did the nerves stop? And he says to me, son, when the nerves stop, you stop. <laughs> so uh, the nerves have never stopped. Um, the, the reason that we're going to do this May and June, we're leading into a, a, the summer, um, July and August, we're going to um, head into a, another new series in July and August called Proclaim. And the idea is that all summer we're going to preach the gospel, we're going to reach out to the lost. We do that each week, but... Um, more emphasis around that, around stories over the summer. And we felt leading up into this as we chatted um, as a team, we felt um, just to lay a foundation for that around the, the air that we breathe, looking at the early church and looking basically the air that they breathed, what they lived in, what was normal practice for the early church, how did this happen, a community saturated um, and stewarding the love and the presence of God. And um, we looked at the gifts individually, and we looked at how um, when a community really operates in those gifts, uh, and they flow together, living in this sort of post-Pentecost world, um, we see that all of us get to play. All of us are empowered agents, you could say, for the kingdom. And so using the book of Acts as our core, our aim is to stir the imagination again of our church body uh, to think about the characteristics of the early church. And again, I say how they can be normal practices for us today. You could um, jump out of the book of Acts and look at revival stories and things in the past and history that would point to this as well. And it's always important whenever the body collectively comes together. There's a beautiful passage in Acts chapter 6 and even right into 7 um, where the seven people are chosen, filled with the Spirit. And the beauty of that is that everybody, what happened was the church was growing at such a phenomenal rate, they realized that everybody needed to get activated. And so Acts 6 is all about that. It's all about people getting activated and people doing different things. So the apostles were giving themselves to prayer and to worship and to the word and people were spirit filled and just leading in the community and their pantries and food banks and all the rest. Their key passage for this is this well-known passage in Acts 2. They devoted themselves, we're going to be looking at that in a moment or two, they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, exactly what we're doing this morning, devoting themselves to teaching, to fellowshipping together, which we do over tea and coffee shortly, um, to the breaking of bread, which we've done, done and getting to prayer walk um, around the streets in a week's time is pretty awesome. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles and all the believers were together and that everything in common, it says they sold property and possessions and give to anyone who would need. And every day they continued to meet together in their temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And leading into our July and August, we love this line, um, the Lord added to their number daily, those who are being saved. So, the church was seeing people saved every day, every day. Pretty awesome, isn't it? And so we need to reach out into our community. And so what we want to do this morning, my focus this morning is to look at these two things, the power and love 
that motivated and activated a church. Because if in some shape or form that has dimmed, then we need to reignite it. Because these were two things that were um, wholly present um, and holistically present in the early church. There were a church where the Holy Spirit was given preeminence. And you can't, now you can't romanticize the early church either. There's loads of problems. You've only got to study the book of Acts to know there's loads of issues and loads of problems to overcome culture and everything else. Um, but um, you, you can't not read the book of Acts and get the sense that anything was possible. Anything could have happened. Um, and that's what I love about it. So imagine living in an atmosphere where it almost seems like anything is possible, that heaven comes so close to earth that the power and love of God are powerful. So when power turns up, there's lots of miracles and people get delivered and set free. When love turns up, people be one-minded in their community, all believers, one heart and one mind. We read that right through the Acts of the Apostles, Acts 4, 32, and other passages reminds us of that. And of course, there were apostolic gifts that led the way, Peter and John, um, and then the Apostle Paul later on, everybody joining in. But there's a little verse in uh, chapter 6, verse 7, that says, and the number of disciples multiplied, multiplied greatly. So people, everybody was getting activated. Everybody was in, all right? It wasn't just a spectator thing. It was a um, partic participator thing. People were coming and par participating in this. Now, I read this story. I love this story. Um, I read this story lately and loved it. In the world of aviation, the sound barrier was once considered unbreakable. Um, many engineers believe that Mach 1 represented a sort of uh, a, a wall that couldn't be penetrated. It was a wall of error, and dozens of pilots actually died trying um, to break the barrier that would only but um, solidify the belief that it couldn't be done. Um, now, at low speeds, um, shock waves are a non factor when it comes to an aircraft, but as they reach higher speeds, the world of aerodynamics change. Um, and when a plane approaches, apparently, um, the speed of sound, shock waves increase that cause the pilots to lose control, uh, and the buildup of air pressure in the front of the, of the plane um, actually creates a drag in the aircraft that continually made it nosedive. And so loads of pilots would have lost their lives as they tried to hit Mach 1. They would literally hit all of this turbulence in such a forcible way, the plane would just either break up, go out of control, or just nosedive uh, and crash. And the British, among others, put their whole attempt to break the sound barrier in hold because their plane, called, their prototype called the, the Swallow, actually self-destructed at Mach 0.94. They almost got there, Mach 0.94. Uh, but that didn't um, deter Chuck Yeager, this young American guy. And on the 14th of um, October, 1947, he took his B-29, um, and she took off from Morrick, High F Morrick Field, um, which is high up in the Californian desert. I actually looked at this in Google Maps last night. Um, now, she was a wee bit different, this joke. She had four engines, but she had a rocket. They'd made a rocket in underneath her. So she climbed to 25,000 feet with the four engines, and then at 25,000 feet, the rocket kicked in, right, and took her to 42,000 feet. And um, as the plane approached Mach 1, this is um, Chuck Yeager's um, view of it. He said that it began to shake violently, and as his plane hit Mach 1, 0.965, we're looking for Mach 1 now. So at 0.965, the speed indicator went haywire. And all the gadgets on the plane started to go everywhere. At Mach 995, the G-force blurred his vision and turned his stomach so that he was physically sick, which doesn't sound wonderful in a plane. Um, and just as it seemed as if the plane would disintegrate, there was a loud sonic boom. And I've heard this, actually, I was on a ferry many years ago. We were heading on holidays to France, and the captain of the, of the ship, um, in the, uh, we were going Rosler to Le Havre, told us that the Concorde 
would be crossing in about 15 minutes' time, and if you wanted to go up on deck, you would hear the sonic boom, and we did that, and it was the most incredible thing. Um, but um, just as it seemed as this plane would disintegrate, there was a loud sonic boom, followed almost by an instantaneous and eerie silence, and the plane crossed the sound barrier at 761 miles per hour. Pretty incredible. And what happened was the air pressure that was pushing on the front of the plane shifted to the back of the plane. Because <laughs> he broke through the sound barrier. And so all the turbulence and all the pressure that was at his, at his head now was on his tail. And he said it, it turned to a sea at last. It went from this turbulent, um, almost disintegrating plane to this sea of glass, um, which was almost eerie in its silence. Jaeger reached Mach 1.07 before cutting his engines and coming back to earth, and the rest is history. The unbreakable barrier was broken. And once it's broken, we know that's like the four-minute mile. It becomes broken all the time. And I, I read this story a couple of weeks ago, and I began to think about the sound barrier like the faith barrier where there's the breaking the faith barrier in the spiritual realms, like breaking the sound barrier in the physical realm. <clears throat> and if you want to experience supernatural breakthrough, you're going to have to pray through. God's been doing something in my life around intercessory prayer for about five years now, and it hasn't all been nice. I just have to be really honest. It's not what you would go after if you just thought you were doing it for yourself. You have to learn supernatural breakthrough. You have to pray through. And as you get closer to breakthrough, it often feels like you're about to lose control and fall apart, Paul. Hence your prayer this morning was spot on. Because I felt as I prepped this message, I felt like I was hitting the sound barrier. And I felt like um, almost losing control of how this was going to come out and about to fall apart. That's when you need to press in. That's when you need to pray through. And if you allow them, if you allow your disappointments, they will create drag. If you allow their disappointments to come, they will nosedive you into the abyss. They will destroy your dreams. But if you press through, hear me in this, please, God will come through and your experience will be supernatural breakthrough. And that which opposed you will come around behind you and propel you. Do you get it? It's the most beautiful thing. It's the most beautiful thing because you know, you know in this moment that it's out of your hands and in the hands of Almighty God. And the natural resistance that was thwarting you turns into some supernatural momentum that propels you. And that is an incredible moment. And we look at the early developments of the church. And I see, this is what I see. I see how these little households of faith grew into them incredible churches because they, they broke through what was creating nosedive, what was creating calamity, what was creating shaking and out of control. They broke through that barrier, that faith barrier where they trusted in Almighty God. And there was a, I'm sure there was a boom in the heavenlies where they broke through into Mach 1 and, and, and that which opposed them now actually propelled them into something very powerful. Now, Everybody likes power. Everybody likes power. We like we talk about the horsepower in our cars. We like uh, if you're like me and you want to watch the Formula One um, today, um, you like power. Our bikes, we want the best. Our phones, we want the best, the most powerful phones, etc. And the Book of Acts, probably more than any other book in the Bible, focuses on power. And we're going to talk about power, and then we're going to talk about love, and then we're going to pray. Um, now. The, the, the book of Acts actually records the arrival of the Holy Spirit on planet Earth, which is powerful, and he had unlimited resources of power. Now, we know that Jesus dominated the four Gospels and all of the stories, but the Holy Spirit dominates the book of Acts, all right? And, and there, the, there's loads of things that the Bible calls the Holy Spirit. He's a comforter. He's a helper. He's an advocate. He is a guide. He empowers the believers. He's a teacher. On and on I could go. There's many references to those. And Jesus, over and over again, would refer to him and told, would tell his disciples that he would go away, and if he went away, another would come, and this one would be better than him. 
And you, we say this all the time, what could be better than Jesus here in flesh? Well, Jesus here in all flesh, because Jesus was limited to a human body. And he said, it's better that I go away because I'm only limited to one place. The Holy Spirit is going to be me and everybody. It's pretty incredible. And, 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 and he would tell them that he would leave and go to the Father. This Holy Spirit would become the administrator of the Godhead. He would become the one who would arrive on planet Earth and he would distribute all of heaven to Earth. He would become like the administrator of the Godhead. And he would be the one who would deliver territory. He would be the one who would help us take this territory. I've loved this word for a long, long time. He would lead us into mission. He would lead us into justice. And he would lead us into claiming territory. Now, Adam, we know this, was given a piece of territory on earth, and it was his place. He was supposed to prosper and grow until he messed it up by following his own wisdom instead of God's. And then God made Abram the father of a nation, a territory. He gave Israel a land flowing with milk and honey. All through the Bible, God is giving people territory. Uh, and, and, and it would take sweat, and it would take hard work, and it would take many battles to lay hold of what God had given them, just like today, but with faith in God and obedience to his directions and trusting his wisdom rather than our own, we could live this life of fulfillment where the work would be blessed and rewarded. And, um, and God's ideal was that everyone, every believer would be secure and provided for in that territory as it was in the Old Testament, so it is in the New. And as I say, the analogy of Israel taking their territory, I think we can carry that through into the New Testament because Christ is advancing the king of the kingdom is here and the kingdom of God is our territory. We have something to take uh, uh, in every aspect of human society. And because of what Christ has done on the cross um, in defeating Satan, we work with him, we work with God to liberate this planet from all satanic activity and moral pollution and restore it to its rightful king, who is King Jesus. That's our territory. And we've been given this area. We've been given Craig Evan. We've been given this ABC, we've been given this area. This is our territory. It's the territory of our king. And so our job is to take it. That's why walking the streets is such a very powerful thing because this is ours to take, all right? We just don't sit in little holy huddles and even just pray for out there. We go out there, go into all the world, all right? So we're salt and light. So light is where we come in. Light, we ask people, we because light's attractional, we ask people to come to the light, but Salt is dispensable, not attractional. And so the salt is dispensable. We throw the salt out. We go out into our communities, into our workplaces. So we need to get it out. And the thing about it is, is the, the exciting mission is everybody gets to play, not spectating, but rather participating and fulfilling this mission aligns with the maker's design, I believe, because we're all different. We're living stones. We're not building blocks. I used to make blocks when I was a boy, um, when I was a lad. Me and Kenny made blocks for many, many years, and they're all the one size. That's not the kingdom. We're not all the same shape. Some of you are looking at me and saying, thank goodness. Um, we're not all the same shape. We're not all the same size. We're not blocks. We're stones, living stones. If ever you've been up the morns and you've looked at those walls, and you think, wow, it's incredible, all the big and small and all working together to build the kingdom to build the wall. Everybody gets to play. So we have territory to take, folks. So we need to get at it, all right? Now, in, um, you know this, that Jesus actually told them to go to Jerusalem and not to do anything until the Holy Spirit would come. He said, um, in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So don't do anything till he arrives. Do not leave Jerusalem. Don't go without the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit doesn't turn up, don't go. This is what Jesus is saying. And then he, he, he elaborates this in John 7, and he says, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being, out of this colea, the seed of his being, will flow rivers of living water. Everybody gets to play. 
This is for everybody. And it is my prayer that you will experience this awesome, life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. And this is why Jesus said it was better for him to go so that the Spirit could come. Now, three things happen immediately when the Spirit turns up. This is really important, all right, because as it was important in Acts 2, it's important here today. He, the Holy Spirit is dynamic in his power. Remember when he arrived on the scene, Dr. Luke couldn't figure out what was happening. He said there was a sound like, a sound of, it, was, it sounded like, it wasn't wind. It, was, it wasn't, it, it, he said that's just what it sounded like. And it looked like there were tongues of fire. There was, no real, there was no real language to explain what was going on because the Holy Spirit's dynamic in his power. He's non-partial in his love. And in his nature, he, he poured himself out on the young, on the old, on the Jew, on the Gentile, male, female, work, Slave, masters, it, it, there was no, it, he's non-partial in his love. There's no junior Holy Spirit. We've seen that last Sunday, what an incredible day. And he was global in his experience. If you count the many languages where people heard in their own um, tongue, you probably find around 15, 16 languages in Acts 2 alone. So all of these things happen. And as the Holy Spirit comes here today, he's dynamic in his power. He can change whatever's going on in your life. He, he's non-partial in his love. He doesn't work on the platform better than he works there. He doesn't work in hierarchy. He works in everybody. He's global in his experience. It doesn't matter where you're from or, or what foot you kick with. It doesn't really matter because he is global in his experience. And... Um, Supernatural things begin to happen in and through regular, normal people because he's super and he's natural. And that's what happens. And here's some of the things that happened when he turned up. Peter stands up, this Peter who um, we would almost claim to be a coward, this Peter who would deny him three times. Um, here stands up um, with the 11 and he raises his voice. He's we never read how he, we don't ever read anywhere in the scripture where he ever preached before. All right, he um, he never addressed the crowd. Never mind, give a full length sermon in his entire life. Yet he stood up and gave the sermon of a lifetime, and uh, bearing witness to the love of God. And we believe that he trusted the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim this supernatural proclamation out of his mouth, and something responded, and three thousand people got saved and baptized that afternoon. That's pretty cool. And, and the whole church had this supernatural devotion. I've preached in devotion many times, and I'm going to preach on it again because I love it. All right, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. In this passage, we, we are given a vision of how God will transform the world. People aren't just sent out by one, one by one. God's plan is to draw individuals into supernatural empowered communities, all right? And, and this, is the, this is the key word, this word devoted. And I'm going to talk about it for a moment or two. The word devoted just means love or loyalty or enthusiasm for a person or a thing or an activity. And without supernatural levels of devotion, dedication, and commitment, any church is hopeless and helpless, all right? Uh, but churches that are filled with love and passion and commitment can impact their community in a supernatural way. So we could preach the most powerful sermons till the cows come home or to Jesus returns and nothing would happen if there wasn't a devotion in the house. Everybody gets to play. And as the devotion lands in the people, something happens when the first church assembled being fully engaged with their highest priority in life on the continuum of low devotion to total devotion. They were totally devoted in multiple ways. Uh, they were devoted to gathering. They were devoted to giving their resources. They were devoted to fellowship. They weren't just consumers of the church services. They were participants. They took their masks off. They committed themselves to serving those in need, and they prioritized being part of a community that had power in it. And as a result, here's the key, the Lord added to their number daily. Who wouldn't want to be part of a church like that? 
And it's all down to this one word. It's all down to this word devoted. And there's my little continuum. And Warwick will be really pleased because I didn't use the flip chart. Um, but you can go low or high on the devoted continuum and you can, you can put yourself there where you feel you are. But these people were devoted in a way, these early disciples, and the church becomes an unstoppable force. Nothing can stop it for the good of the world. And, um, and so I, I began to ask myself, how, how, how could we be devoted in this continuum to allow power in our life? What would have to happen to give us a, a power that, that, that could see the world changed? And I, I, there's loads of things, but two jumped out at me. I think that, firstly, something will have to die. Verily, verily, I say to you, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. I think Western civilization, we were in a, a meeting not that long ago with the guys, and they were saying that if you really want to see God move at the minute, you probably need to go south of the equator and east, <laughs> around Asia and places like that. You need to go south of the equator. It feels like north and west, the Western civilization have become so consumeristic. We don't need God in many aspects because we've got everything going. And I wondered when I was prepping this to, you know, to be useful and impactful in this life, anything that distracts us from keeping Christ at the center must die, all right? To be totally devoted, our desire for popularity, for fame, for self-pleasures, for the cushy life, must die. Now, it's not wrong to have good things, and it's not wrong to work hard and have nice things. I'm not saying that in any shape or form. But what I'm saying is when they take the place of God in our lives, when they become God in our lives, that's a problem. And whatever competes with your devotion for God, it must die. It must become, it might be even something that has had a grip on you for a long time time. This is why the apostle Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. He was saying, I have to deal with that stuff every day. So you start your knees on your knees each day. God, is there any stuff that I need to die to today? I do this all the time. Um, and is there anything that must give way to the greater love? All right. So your love for this, um, John Thompson was actually saying this this week that you can't say sin's not nice. Anybody that says sin's not pleasurable, stupid. Of course it's pleasurable. You wouldn't do it if it wasn't pleasurable. Of course it's nice. But it give, you, have to, it, you have to give way to the greater love. This is why as a husband or as a wife, you don't commit adultery. You don't commit adultery, not because you're keeping the rules. It's because there's a greater love in your life. And that, that's a greater love. And so you, you, you go for the greater love. And then the lesser love isn't really that important. And so um, it's really important to understand something about that. And then I feel there has to be a renewed love for the Word. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Be totally devert, devoted. These, these verses, that, verses like I have a little list of them that are just lifeblood to me. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or think according to the power that works in me, Ephesians 3.20. I want to know I could go. And I've never found fulfillment in low devotion. I've never found fulfillment in low devotion. Um, and what does it take for us to move to higher devotion and power? What does it take us to move to higher devotion and love? I love some of these Hebrew terms for love. This one, um, the Hebrew word which is pronounced ahava, means to give, it's spontaneous, it's spontaneous. It's an impulsive love. It's mentioned 250 times in the Old Testament or the Hebrew word hesed, which is like a deliberate choice of affection or kindness. And so when you come to this word ahava, you find it all through the song of Solomon. He brought me to his banqueting hall. He looked on me with ahava, love. This love that is such a powerful thing, young women of Jerusalem. And this is for all of you young couples who are dating this is important. I charge you by the gazelles. I charge you by the gazelles and the wild does of the field. Do not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. If you awaken it before the right time, you'll never be able to put it to bed again. So it's really important. 
for those of you young people who are dating, do not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time, until your vows are made and you're committed to that one. That's just a little side note. Or this one, I love this one. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal in your arm, for love is as strong as death. It's jealousy as enduring as the grief of love. Ahava flashes like fire. The brightest light kind of flee in many waters can't quench this type of love, nor rivers drown it. If a man tried to buy love with all his wealth, his offer would be utterly scorned. Ahava is the strongest affection for another. And while some scholars refer it to sexual love, potentially, um, it's more than that. It's much more. The little verb, av, av, means to give. This love is not about the lover, it's about the other. <laughs> um, this love pulls us out of our thinking just about ourselves and throws us into the wildness of relationship. This love, ahava, is not about how you feel when you're with someone. It's about how you make them feel when they're with you. It's a beautiful type of love. This is the love that God displays. Love is seen here is perceived to be eternal. And, um, and when used accordingly in the marriage relationship, there's a devotion to one another that cannot be broken by anything other than death. And some of us in the room know that feeling today. Um, but here's the thing. This is why it can't be broken in eternity, because there is no death. <laughs> Not beautiful? So the ahava of God is eternal, can't be broken. And situations will arise, and there will be other difficult seasons, but there's just something. And the Bible's full of this. I began to study this through the week, and I found the New Testament full of ahava, this love that it's not about the lover, it's about the other. All of these references, all in the New Testament, are all about, all about Ahava. This is, this, is how, this is how God loves you, folks. This is why your devotion should be so high. This is, why you, this is why when we go back, and I know you're still reading those, but we'll pick up on them later. But this is why you must be high on the devoted continuum because I present to you as I've done before a father when he thought about you emptied heaven of his richest treasure. Why? Because he didn't think about the lover, he thought about the other. I present to you a son today, Jesus Christ, greater love has no man than this than one who would lay down his life for his friends. High devotion? I think so. I present to you a Holy Spirit today who is filling you constantly, guiding you constantly, leading you daily, speaking to you every day of your life, 24-7, high or low. I think we can stick them on the high end. All of heaven going to you today is on the high end of the devotion, and that's why every morning when you're, if you're listening to my devotions, I say this little line, and I don't say it out of habit. I say, God, open my eyes, my ears, and my heart today to what you want to do. Because I want to be high on the devotion continuum and final verse. And the guys are going to come and worship. I'd love, I'd love Patty, if you do that song, This Is My Story. I'd love us to finish with that song because of a reason for that. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, those who have went before, our loved ones now who are standing on the balconies of heaven cheering us on, saying, come on, come on, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Our loved ones, the ones that have um, went on before us are there standing with the heroes of heaven because they're one of them now. And they're saying, let us he, he said, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Listen, listen to this, fixing our eyes, devotion, high on the devotion continuum, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorned us to him, sat down in the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such um, opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is where the lost are going to be won. This is where the poor are going to be clothed and fed. Justice will be paramount in these communities. And we will rewrite the story of a broken city and broken cities and nations of the world. I'd love us to pray. And I'd love us to sing this song as our closing prayer, all right? This is my story. This is my song. All right, because you've got... 
I know sometimes we can get so consumed by our own story, but there's a bigger story. And this is your story. This is your story. And I feel so strong about this. I feel that there's a fresh measure of power and love. And um, I feel that I've carried it for a few days to the point it's actually hurt in a good way. (laughs) I felt the load of it so heavy. And I, I love... I'd, I'd love you to participate in that power and love. And what I'd love to do, I'd love just, um, just, I'd love you just to come to the front as we sing this song. You might want to come and kneel. You might want to come and stand if you can't kneel. And if it takes you too long to get up, just stand. Um, but I'd love if we could move those tables. And there might be one came up, there might be five. I don't really know, but I'm just doing what I felt the Lord telling me to do. I feel, I feel God said to me this morning, there's power and love at the altar this morning. There's a fresh measure of power and love at the altar this morning. And just ask people to come and receive. I'm not going to manipulate it. Um, our prayer ministry team are about, and I'd love you um, just to lay hands on people. You don't need to really pray anything, just an impartation of the Holy Spirit. That's all we need to do this morning, all right? And then afterwards, if there's something you'd like to pray it for, you can get that. That's no problem. But at this moment in time, just as our prayer ministry team, even you just want to walk about, if there's people, come to the front. We'll see. Um, but I'm inviting you now. Just let's stand together. I'm going to sing this song as our prayer. I'm not saying again. I'm just saying there's power and love. And I, I, I believe it's at the altar this morning. I believe it's here. And... Um, and uh, I believe that God wants to impart it to you in a fresh new measure this morning in a very powerful way. So just as we sing this song, make your way up to the front. And then after we sing the song, I'll close us in prayer. Thanks, James. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.
is over, but I'd love the guys to play on if that's all right. I know you've been busy all morning, but um, I just sense there's a ministry here if you want to stay in it. Um, parents, if you want to go and grab your kids, that would be great. But I'd love us just to, if you get your tea and coffee, just slip out easily. I'd love us just to take another few minutes, so maybe five minutes or so, just feel like the presence of God is here and he's still working and he's still moving. And so if you want to just stay in that, um, um, yeah, enjoy it. And may the Lord bless you and have a incredible week and have a safe day tomorrow. I know it's holiday day, but Father, just seal your word and just pray, God, thank you for the story that you've invited us into, this great story as we worship you over the next few minutes. Again, would you just minister to us in Jesus' name. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. For more information about our church and all that we do, please visit our website at emmanuel-church.co.uk.